Netflix's When They See Us recounts the stunning true story of the Exonerated Five. I'm Zach Laws of Gold Derby, and with me now are two of the editors of that series, Terrilyn A. Shropshire and Michelle Tesoro. Uh, thank you both for being here so much. Let me first ask you this. Uh, this is such an important story. Uh, for those who don't know, it's all about the, the Central Park Five, formerly known as the Central Park Five. Five young men who were wrongfully accused of uh, raping a white woman in Central Park and sent to prison for many years. What did you, what kind of responsibility did you feel to get this story right? Well, <clears throat> for me, it was a huge responsibility and it's really what drove a lot of um, the days in the editing room. I mean, you have this, this world in which you have to create and introduce an audience to these men. Some people will know who they were, some will know a little bit about the story, some won't know anything about the story. And, you know, there was a huge responsibility to feel like you were, you know, telling their story. These are living human beings who endured insurmountable types of atrocities um, as young boys. And you thought about them every day. I mean, every day that you were coming into the cutting room, you know, you saw these actors that were playing these men and you, you know, Ava and I talked about it a lot. You know, we really wanted to get it right and we wanted to get their story right. It was the first time that was being told from their perspective. So it was, it was incredibly important. Michelle, do you yeah. have anything you want to add to that? I will, I will second that with Terry. I mean, you have to always keep in mind that these are real people and, you know, not, and starting from scratch from their story and just taking it from that point of view instead of starting it from what happened to them, starting with them being being boys and taking it from that point of view. And I think, and, and not just the moment that that they were taken in and questioned and, and everything happened to them, but but also, you know, how it affected their lives moving forward and how it still affects their lives today. Um, I think, yeah, it's a it was a huge responsibility. <laughs> I think obviously on the part of 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 all of us and of Ava. And I think, you know, Ava, you know, was always in conversations with them and their family and and really trying to understand on on a very um, raw basic level like who they were and what, what they were going through. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, for anybody who was not aware of the real case, uh, you know, maybe they weren't uh, alive back then or they were too young to know about it or, you know, sometimes you just uh, don't, don't know about things. I mean, tell us a bit just about the significance of the real life case and, and, and uh, you know, how, how it affected the whole country at that time. Terry, you're better to speak about this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting to talk to people about it now because in some ways it really depended on what age you were at. I mean, you know, there was obviously a knowledge from a lot of people about this, uh, about what was going on, but it's truly a lot of the people that were living in New York, a lot of the young people that were living in New York, um, people that were the same age of these young men when it was happening, you know, you can talk to those those people that were living living it every day and living in New York every day, and they will talk about it a lot differently from somebody who you know is obviously just learning about it. And what I found interesting about my process in it is, you know, you think you know the story, you you think you know, but so much of it obviously was media driven. And what I found was when I came onto the project. Um, there was a certain point where there was only so much more I wanted to know and I wanted to learn the, the rest of it through my work on the project, you know? And what I found myself doing to some degree was actually stepping back a bit, you know, and letting the story, you know, letting myself be an audience um, to the story and how, and introducing my own self to the story. And then at a certain point, as I moved forward in it, I started to kind of, then you know read more and then, then there was a certain point where i was listening to the 411 calls which actually end up in the movie the actual 411 calls from um the um the uh the actual night uh that's how it ultimately ended up being part of the film and i think that uh you know the significance of it what's interesting about what's happening now is there's a i feel like there's a whole new generation 
that is learning about this story in a way that, you know, the people that knew it, um, you know, they're reliving it and it's very visceral. I mean, the, the, the response has been unbelievable, but then there's this whole, you know, new generation of people that are learning about this and finding parallels to today. Yeah, I mean, right. I think, oh, go ahead, Michelle. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I would say I would be in the camp of people who were just learning about this. I mean, the the boy or when I jumped onto the show, but you know, the boys are basically only a few years older than me. So, you know, when I think when I did, you know, my research on it before starting on it, I was basically watching the Ken Burns documentary um, and whatever was online. But um, what's interesting about it is, you know, unfortunately it doesn't seem very different than what's going on currently, you know, so. Yeah, I think. Uh Oh, go ahead. Uh, I, I think the question that uh, people ask, uh, most of all, is, you know, I mean, why tell this now? And it's because, sadly, mm -hmm. uh, it needs to be told now because, you know, not a lot has changed. It seems we just keep going in these endless cycles. And uh, I think the extraordinary thing that this show does, uh, you mentioned the documentary. Obviously, that's, that's a very powerful uh, portrayal of what happened. But what you guys do in the show is you really put us there in the interrogation rooms, in the prisons, with these young men, and you understand the harshness of, of what they went through. So let me just ask you about that. Uh, you, Terilyn, you edited episode one, which was all about the arrest and the interrogation. And uh, Michelle, you edited episode three, which was all about their time behind bars and their uh, eventual release. Uh, so let me start with you, Terilyn. Um, What's so interesting about part one is it's almost like a horror movie, you know, because it's it's terrifying to watch. Can you talk a bit about putting that together? Yeah, I mean, I found myself as I was even watching dailies and you know what's going to happen. There's this element of, you know, it's kind of like don't go in the park. It's it's like the point at which each boy decides that they're going to the park that day. and And I think part of you know, bringing people into the story was the idea of getting to know these boys as boys that could be boys from anywhere. Yeah, these boys lived in Harlem, but it could be any any young men who were deciding to make, you know, to go into the park, you know, on a spring break. And that that idea of as, you know, as these two lives were converging, the lives of the boys and the lives of what would be Trish Miley, and the, the idea that, you know, there's gonna be a convergence that's happening and, you know, I, I just found myself having that sense of this, this horror that's about to happen and not wanting the boys to go in the park, like don't go into the park. And, um, and I think that, that in a sense, the way that it unfolds was we wanted it to unfold in such a way where you're almost wondering how can this happen, but then you see how it happened. And the idea of taking these boys' stories which in some ways are very linear in nature within the, the script and really starting to kind of fold them into one another and how one person's coercion brought on the destruction of another. There is a lot of horrific things that happened within, from the course, from the point that they decided to go into that park to the point where, you know, uh, Corey never came home. And even from a music standpoint and from a sonic standpoint, that was something that was a, 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 a discussion. And, you know, when Chris Bowers talked, the composer talked to us about it and talked to Ava about it, it, it really was about creating this kind of thematic sense of a horror, horror story of sorts. Yeah, I mean, what's uh, really uh, extraordinary about it is that even though we know the outcome, you're still sitting there just hoping for something different to happen. You know, yeah. but you understand the the outcome's inevitable. Yeah. Um, Michelle, let me ask you. So, you know, you you uh, you're covering their time in prison and then their time trying to rehabilitate to society. And uh, you know, I actually I went to an event where I saw uh, Oprah talking to the Exonerated Five. And the thing that really strikes you is that all these years later, uh, it still is with them. You know, so right. can you talk about portraying that part of their of their lives? Right, I think, um, you know, so in part three, we, we pick them up when, when they're all incarcerated um, in their various, except for Corey, 
Um, so I have the four, um, which are Antron and Raymond and um, Yousef and Kevin. Um, and it's only really, we cover one scene of them in uh, when they were younger and then we transition each each boy to when they're adults. And m the majority of the episode is when they're adults and what they deal with once they are released. And um, and I think that is that is what we're trying to focus on in that episode is, um, is what it was like that even though you they you think that you've served your time there's this there are these extra things that you have to deal with you know in terms of what kind of job you can get if you can get a job um and you know how your family has dealt with it while you were away and the effects on them because there were many people who who believed of their of their guilt and who punished not only them but their family as you know during the time they were in and continued while they were out. So I, I think it's really important that people don't forget that, oh, you know, you they just, they serve their time and, and they should get over it or something. Cause it's not anything to get over. Um, Cause you can't, it, it follows you everywhere, you know? Um, so I, I think that, that that's what this episode was focusing on. And, and also the recidivism of, of it all of, you know, you're out, you're trying, to, you're trying to live your life as Raymond Santana Jr. does. Um, and, you know, he, he goes down a path that, that doesn't keep him out, that, you know, he ends up going back and, and how that is a very common storyline with, with those who are incarcerated. Um, so, you know, I, I think mostly it's important to know that this was a lasting effect. It's not just something that happened to them when they were boys, that it continues, as you said, you know, when you saw the panel, like they are forever changed and their life is, 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 is no matter how much money the state wants to award them, it's like, it, it'll never be reparations you know, yeah. for, for a life changed. For both of you, um, uh, I think from a storytelling standpoint, one of the biggest challenges had to be just having so many characters, not just the five young men, but their parents, their, you know, their families. You've also got uh, the people in law enforcement, the prosecutors, the lawyers, the police officers. How, talk a bit about just juggling all these different characters and making sure that all of them got their due. I mean, obviously you've got uh, about four and a half, five hours to do that on overall, but for your segments specifically, how did you uh, juggle all of these different characters? Well, for me, it was definitely one of the more challenging aspects uh, because really with one, you have the responsibility of introducing your audience to every single one of, not only you're right, the boys, but their families. And you know, often when something like this happens, the question comes: Where were their parents, and how did this happen? Why didn't they defend them? What you know? And I think in one, you're able to kind of get a sense of exactly who the parents were, and why they they were able to do as much as they could at the time, and they were in the, their sense that they were trying to do the best they could um, based on their past experiences. I mean, you look at Antron's father, who was you know, a convict, and he, all he wanted to do was to keep his son out of that world by any means necessary, and it's it has its repercussions throughout the rest of the piece. I mean, I think for me, you know, when it, when it comes to the detectives, you know, everybody had their truth. Everybody was, you know, in, in their minds that they were doing what their, their duty or responsibility was, you know, fair scheme, she had a mission, you know, she was someone who wanted a better, you know, in a very twisted way, she wanted to, um, she was dealing with rapes and murders in New York at that time. And, and she, you know, she was hell bent on making sure that someone paid for what happened to Trish Miley. And, you know, and, and, and you get a sense that they were all kind of brought into this, this situation where they were all so absolutely sure in their right that this is what had to happen. And yet, you know, it, it, it's, it's one of those complicated things for me also where if people didn't connect with the boys at the beginning, if you didn't, 
if you didn't feel for them, if you weren't able to follow who they were and what they were going through and their parents, then ultimately you would not stay for the rest of it. And so in some ways, I've often heard from people how difficult it was to watch one. And at the same time, you know, it one is one of those things where you felt like based on everything that they went through and what their families went through, you know, you have a responsibility to 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 not only watch one, but then to watch the rest of it. I think that the big, yeah, the challenge was making sure that by the time we got to the end of one, you truly understood who these boys were and who their parents were and and so that you could take them into manhood, you know, and, and take the families and deal with the repercussions of one decision, a decision of a mom going home, decision of another father, you know, coming late, a decision of a father telling his son to, you know, tell them what they want to hear. Um, and so trying to kind of put that in in such a way that it just, you know, moves towards that inevitable, like as you said, an inevitable conclusion, I think, you know, was challenging, but really, really rewarding. Michelle? Right. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, um, I think that episode three cha um, three's challenge was was to show you that the story continued on and and having episode one and two really established those relationships of of a who who the kids were who their parents were you know the various degrees of 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 how each parent was involved and um you know in episode three it's interesting that you know there's a lot of guilt you know on on the side of the parents and and how or or in kevin's case angie his sister um, and how that has affected the parents and how they how they related to the child as they were inside and when they came out. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the Angie when, when Terry was talking about that kind of, you know, what the parent what the parents did and the older people did. It's like, you know, Angie in, in episode one makes this decision because she sees her younger brother in like such dire straits. That's such a heartbreaking scene when he's like, no, I just want to go home. I just want to just, just sign, just sign. And she, she knows that there's something wrong here and she doesn't want to do it. And, but she does anyway, because what do you, what are you supposed to do in that situation? You know, and, um, and then years later, it, it really eating at her to the point where she really couldn't live her life you know she found it very hard to live her life um and and also you know terry mentions um bobby mccray and and how that decision of you know the fear based on his experience um also being in prison um push him to push his son to do something that that would affect his life and how later on in my episode um you know, you had to have connected with that storyline earlier, earlier on, because really in episode three, there's only three scenes with with the two of them, and it is really palpable um, the tension and how how Antron um, is is really struggling with his feelings towards his father. Um, and I think I think it's challenging, but like three doesn't work without without one and two, if you know what I mean. So, um, but but yeah, it's, I think my challenge was to, to try to remind people in the beginning who these boys were just to remind them and then transition them, you know, to adulthood and by keeping the adult scenes closer to their boyhood scenes in my episode, that it, it really helped. Let me ask you both this before, uh, before I let you go. Uh, the, the response to this has been overwhelmingly positive. Um, uh, you know, I'm, and people are, are, are watching this all over the, the globe. Were you uh, surprised that there was this much um, passionate good feeling for this? You know what I mean? That this much this much interest in this story from 30 years ago. Um, I find it overwhelming and humbling, to be perfectly honest. I mean, you know, in the editing room, you're in such a vacuum. 
and you're living with this story every day. You're living with these boys every day. You're coming in and having to kind of go through that footage and, and the interrogation. And, and you really do get yourself very much kind of in this vacuum of sorts, to, you know, to be working hard, to get it right, to get it. And then at a certain point, you kind of let it go. You, know, you let it go out in the world and you just don't know. And so in a sense, I knew how I felt. You know, I knew how I felt when the dailies came in. The first time I saw the scene with Bobby and, and um, Antron, I know how I felt when Corey is being, in you know, in, in that storeroom. And I knew how I felt when, when Kevin, you know, ultimately, you know, turns his, his, you know, suddenly has to start making up a story and, and, and then it becomes his, that truth. Right. And so, you know, I knew that for me, it was affecting and, and ultimately we are the first audience. And I, I had to hope that, that it would be able to affect people. Um, you know, and I'm just talking one, but then after you saw two and three and four and, and the scripts, that's, they, they, they unfolded that way. I mean, by the time I got to four in the script, I was just a mess. And so now it's been really interesting to, to now go on social media and have people say, oh my God, one, and then you go to two and three, and by the time they get to four, they're a mess. And so in a sense, it's, 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 it's nice to feel that, yeah, that, that it has affected people in a way that you want, you know, you want them to think and, and to, and, uh, and so, but at the same time, it's still overwhelming. I mean, it's a, it's a wondrous thing to be a part of something that is affecting people on such a level and um, causing them to, you know, think more about their own lives and research more. And that's ultimately what you do want to do as an artist is you want to bring people into a world and yes, entertain them, but then leave them with something that where they want to, you know, to go on and maybe learn more about what you put out there. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> I always knew just from the scripts and, and, and from frankly, you know, Ava being the director that it, this was going to be a very special story, you know, and um, I had no doubt it was going to be huge. Um, but I do remember the first time I watched that first cut with Terry of episode one, like I knew that this was going to be such a hard thing to, to, to watch, but so important. And I, I, I'm, I wasn't to summers. I, I wasn't that shocked when it was, when it, the effect that it had on people, what I was sort of surprised at as how people were able to watch one after another and binge it. Cause I remember watching it going, Oh my God, this just takes me every episode takes me to takes me all over the map and my emotions are completely a roller coaster. I don't know if I would be able to watch it one after another, but I think people, people get connected to the boys. And I, I think what's so strong about telling their story in this way is it, it has the ability to, you know, film and uh, itself has the ability to, to um, create empathy where empathy is needed. And, and this is where we needed it. And, and I think, you know, also the choice to, to name the series when they see us really hones in on that. It's like, don't forget what you know, this is, these are these boys, this is it from, this was their perspective. This is what they went through. This is, this is the story um, was just really powerful. And I'm, I'm happy to have been a part of it. Well, thank you both so much for your time. Uh, it's a very powerful film and uh, you know, obviously it's, it's causing a lot of uh, discussion and hopefully it can lead to some positive change. Thank you both for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to all of you at home for watching. Make sure you uh, click the like and subscribe button below and make sure you visit us at goldderby.com.